Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to give notice of the following uh, motion, which is the current state of the nation. Recognizing that the state of the nation at this moment, the ongoing protest following the passing of the Finance Bill, National Assembly Bill number 30 of 2024, on the 25th of June 2024, by the National Assembly, the loss of lives, maiming and loss of property that has been occasioned by the following this uh, protest, cognizant that pursuant to Article 115 1B of the Constitution, His Excellency the President of the Republic of Kenya declined to assent to the bill and referred it back to the National Assembly with recommendations to delete all clauses of the bill, further acknowledging that the conversation on the finance bill has triggered a broader important public conversation on the question of the high cost of living juxtaposed against the wasteful expenditure in all public institutions, Parliament included. Further acknowledging that the issues raised by the young people and other members of the public to do with corruption, impunity, incompetence within the state and public appointments, opulent lifestyle of public officials, unemployment, and high cost of living, among other issues, bedeviling our country. Now, therefore, the Senate calls upon, one, the National Assembly to expeditiously consider the Presidential Memorandum pursuant to Article 115.2a, two, all government ministries, departments and agencies and constitutional commissions, including Parliament, to put in, put in place austerity measures in undertaking, undertaking their respective functions, three, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission and other government multi-sector agencies in the governance, justice and law and order sector to upscale and make concerted effort to fight corruption. Four, the National Police Service to seize abductions, unlawful arrest, extrajudicial killings and other exercise and exercise rest restraint in dealing with peaceful and unarmed demonstrators. Five, release of all persons arrested for planning and participating in peaceful demonstrations relating to the enactment of the finance bill. Six, the government to waive the hospital bills for persons who have been injured and defray funeral expenses for those who've lost their lives during the demonstration. And seven, the judiciary um, consider, uh, ju the judiciary to prioritize and expedite all court cases relating to the enactment of the finance bill and resultant demonstrations. Two, Consider all the challenges facing the country and make the necessary recommendations to address them. Next order. Order number seven. Questions and statements. Order number eight, motion. The current state of the nation. Majority Leader. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move the following motion that the current state of the nation, recognizing the state of the nation at this moment, the ongoing protest following the passing of the finance bill, National Assembly Bill number 30 of 2024, on the 25th of June 2024, by the National Assembly, the loss of lives, maiming and loss of property that has been occasioned following this protest, cognizant that pursuant to Article 115.1 of the Constitution, His Excellency the President of the Republic of Kenya declined to assent to the bill and referred it back to the National Assembly with recommendations to delete all clauses of the bill, acknowledging that the conversation on the finance bill has triggered a broader, a broader important public conversation on the question of the high cost of living juxtaposed against the wasteful expenditure in all public institutions, including Parliament, Further acknowledging the issues raised by the youth and other members of the public to do with corruption, impunity, uh, incompetence within state and public appointments, opulent, opulent lifestyles of public officials, unemployment, and high cost of living, among other 
issues bedeviling the, econo uh, the economy. Now, therefore, the Senate, one, calls upon the National Assembly to expeditiously consider the Presidential Memorandum pursuant to Article 115.2a. B, all government ministries, departments and agencies and constitutional commissions, including Parliament, to put in place austerity measures in undertaking their res respective functions. Three, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission and other government multi-sector agencies in the governance, justice, law and order sector to upscale and make concerted efforts to fight corruption. Four, or B uh, D rather, the National Police Service to seize abductions, unlawful arrest, extrajudicial killings, and exercise restraint in dealing with the peaceful uh, and unarmed uh, demonstrators. E, release of all persons arrested for planning and participating in the peaceful demonstrations relating to the enactment of the finance bill. F, the government to waive hospital bills for persons who have been injured and defray funeral expenses for those who lost their lives during the demonstration. And G, the judiciary to prioritize and expedite all court cases relating to the enactment of the finance bill and resultant demonstration. Two, consider all the challenges facing the country and make necessary recommendations to address them. Mr. Speaker, sir, we are gathered here this morning and I wish to appreciate the fact that before the commencement of the city this morning, you led us as a house to, in a minute of silence, reflect and think deeper on the issues that our country faces at this particular moment. And we particularly took time to commiserate and feel the pain and the burden that it is with the families and friends of, as per the count of the uh, Kenya National Commission of Human Rights, 39 persons that have so far lost their lives in this going in the last two weeks, Mr. Speaker, as we've had these demonstrations. Mr. Speaker, we acknowledge as a house, and I'd wish to go on record about this, that this is an indictment of us as a leadership in this country, that we are in an extremely difficult place where, if we are not careful, not many countries have gotten to this point and turned back. There are some that 20, 30, 50 years are still turning, trying to turn back, actually, after moments such as this. Therefore, this calls for introspection. This calls for a rethink. This calls for serious empathy on our part as a leader. And I have said this many times on the floor of this house, Mr. Speaker, that the challenges that we face as a country, on many occasions, we have very limited choice. First, in terms of whether to tackle or not, but second and most importantly, on what has been our input as any individual who's in a position of responsibility to get the country to a better space. Therefore, as I begin, Mr. Speaker, I'd wish to personally, and this is at a personal level, not even necessarily as Senator Fokericho, Majority Leader, but just as a leader and somebody who God has granted the opportunity to serve in a position of responsibility in this country, to tender my unreserved apology to the country for either by commission or omission everything that I have contributed into getting us into the mess and the place that we are in. I have reflected deeply the last few days, Mr. Speaker, and looked through my own journey as an individual and asked myself very serious questions, trying to wear the shoes of the ordinary citizens and how they feel at this particular moment about me as a person. I don't want to focus about any other individual, whichever office they occupy, 
but just me. A citizen of this country that God in his own wisdom granted the opportunity to serve in a place of responsibility and try to retrace my steps. What is it that perhaps I should have done better? I have to be sincere, Mr. Speaker, that there were days in the night that I contemplated even quitting and said, perhaps maybe other people can do it. But this is not the time uh, to quit. Because quitting doesn't solve. It doesn't get us out of the hole that you already are in. If it's about getting out and running away, Mr. Speaker, you first sort the mess that you created. I'm afraid, Mr. Speaker, that I know that is the agony that many of our colleagues have thought through. And therefore, just to bring the country up to speed and appreciate why the Senate of the Republic of Kenya is seated this morning, is that we had a session yesterday in the afternoon where we sat down as a Senate of the Republic of Kenya off camera, not in this chamber, but seated somewhere together and reasoned and said, what is it that we can make as our contribution? We are deeply embarrassed, Mr. Speaker, that it has taken young children to point to us that you are naked as our leaders. Extremely troubling. A moment that to many of the people that I listened to yesterday in the afternoon as leaders shared their experiences and what has been the last few weeks, I realized that we are in extraordinary times and ordinary solutions that we have proposed in the past cannot work this time. Unless we are serious, unless we are genuine, unless we are honest, unless we mean it, let us not begin this conversation in this house this morning, Mr. Speaker. And I'd wish to put it on record that I come 100% willing and committed, standing before the Senate and the Republic of Kenya knowing well, that one way or the other, I have made a contribution that I am ready to be persuaded and to be led jointly, first of all, by the leaders that are here and by the things that we are being told by the people that are speaking in the public spaces and the conversation that's going on in the country, Mr. Speaker, on what we need to do to redeem and win back our country so that people can reflect back. And therefore, we have come up with this motion, Mr. Speaker. This is just by the beginning of guiding the country towards solutions. And we'd wish to make a certain number of requests to you as our leader, Mr. Speaker, together with the office of the clerk that is here, that as members will be speaking, let it be known that many of them will take time to paint the state of the nation. That's why we have titled this motion, The State of the Nation. As it is, with no filters, with no embarrassments, Mr. Speaker, pointing and saying things as they are, that this is what is wrong, this is what we hear, and spend the remainder or the latter part of their conversation, Mr. Speaker, in proposing solutions. There are those that we can do within us as the Senate. There are those that we can do as the legislature, which is us and the National Assembly. There are things and solutions that we are being asked to make a change at the level of the executive, we will make the recommendation. There are those that constitutionally mandated institutions, Mr. Speaker, have to do. And we have to interact with them and guide, Mr. Speaker, how they do it. Because like I have already pointed out, Mr. Speaker, these are not normal times. And normal solutions will not get, at, get us out of this uh, problem at this particular time, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, the request that we make to you is that get us staffers of parliament who will classify as members speak all these challenges that you are speaking to and cluster them into the various thematic areas so that we deal we are ready and willing to work whatever time over and above the call of duty beyond even 6 30 mr speaker if that is what it will take because unfortunately we don't have time that is the other thing that the young people are telling us that's the other thing that i hear when i listen to what the country is, is saying we are willing and ready to work, Mr. Speaker, so that we classify all these challenges and the various solutions that we are prescribing. Some of them have been suggested by other people outside the precincts of this house. Many others will be shared by these members because 
they are senior people here. There are people who are experienced. They know what the challenges are and they know what the contribution can be. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I want to appreciate the meeting that happened yesterday in the afternoon where we agreed that not even apportioning blame at this particular time will rescue anybody. When the protesters showed up, Mr. Speaker, in Parliament last week, none of us was spared. And I'd like to say rightly so. Because much as we may have wished that, oh, deal with the National Assembly, they're the ones who are handling the finance bill, they don't care. They just know that you're leaders. And you're the ones who, by whatever means that is possible, have done this or the other. And therefore we say that as a Senate, as we begin our reflection in the next few days, as we propose solutions, far-reaching implications, answers to questions that we are being asked as a people in both our private and public spaces, Mr. Speaker. Because this conversation has not spared anybody. And it hasn't taken the traditional definitions or characterizations that we know about issues in this country. Nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with the tribe, nothing to do with class, uh, Mr. Speaker. These are unique challenges that have caught over all of us. Mr. Speaker, therefore, we request that when we get our staffers to classify the challenges as, as they will be enlisted by the various uh, members, say, for example, on the issue of uh, corruption, and this is the proposals that are being made, if our staffers can serve, serve as the rapporteurs, Mr. Speaker, so that later on when we sit to reflect and make our decisions, once we've classified all the issues into the various thematic areas, Mr. Speaker, we will retreat and reconvene as a House, Mr. Speaker, to make the various far-reaching recommendations. Whatever it is that as Parliament we need to do, if it is a change of law, we are willing to do it in record time, Mr. Speaker. And I know we have your cooperation, Mr. Speaker, and you will help us make that. If it is a resolution of the House specific to the various constitutional commissions on, and independent office holders, Mr. Speaker, we will make a resolution. Because there are two ways in which Parliament makes decisions, Mr. Speaker. We either vote on a bill or we resolve on a matter and give it as a resolution of the House. We intend to pursue whatever means it will take, Mr. Speaker, to heal the country and make us better as we are being challenged in the last few days, uh, Mr. Speaker. The country is complaining of a broken system, Mr. Speaker, that nothing works. Absolutely nothing that this is a rigged economy where only those with proximity to power and the advantage unduly given to them by the spaces they occupy, either in public or private institutions, Mr. Speaker, are able to enjoy living in the country. And we are being asked to repair and fix it. Where this thing has reached, Mr. Speaker, it needs an overhaul. I am afraid that not the usual glue and gum that we put into areas that are leaking will solve this time. It's completely broken. If it's a pipeline, Mr. Speaker, it is time to decommission and set up a new pipeline. That's what I hear as being challenged. We are being told that everybody wants a fair shot at life and not our children to get better chances at education. Better chances, Mr. Speaker. I grew through our public education systems from primary to secondary to university, Mr. Speaker. And it was the best at that particular time. People are complaining, Mr. Speaker, that unfortunately, as it is today, nobody with a pen in this country takes their children either to public, uh, primary, secondary, or even university because it's completely finished, uh, Mr. Speaker. The picture of the primary schools that we all went to, Mr. Speaker, while it served and it worked at that particular time, public education is broken at this time. And we must make radical decisions because, Mr. Speaker, that's what they are speaking to. And they are saying, while you guys are okay, what about the kid of the ordinary person? You know, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 when, when every time I lost sleep, as I thought through about the issues that we've uh, been through as a country, Mr. Speaker, I asked myself, where is it? that we as leaders have lost touch with the reality. I didn't grow up as a child of privilege, Mr. Speaker, for your information. I am 38 years old. I came to this parliament at the age of 29. The first 29 years of my life, I spent them in Eastlands, deep in the slums. I have sold Sim Sim. Like these kids you see on our streets in Ngong Road as you drive, uh, Mr. Speaker, and many times when I, I see them, 
I reflect back and I roll down my windows and I share with them because I know that they are complimenting what their parents are doing. That's what sends these kids out to the streets. I know what it feels, Mr. Speaker. But why is it that when granted such an opportunity, we are not able to make it better? I believe that an opportunity to serve, Mr. Speaker, and this is what I hear us being told as a leaders, an opportunity to serve is to be reminded that we have issues, but we have looked at you and we think you have the wisdom and the ability to make it work for all of us. Can you go and serve? Go and make it possible for the rest of us to enjoy. But unfortunately, either by design or because that is what the country is accustomed to, Mr. Speaker, when you get the first line at the queue, we don't think about the second and the third onwards, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are satisfied that so long as I've had my serving at the table, that will be enough. That's what people are complaining about, Mr. Speaker. And we are here to plead this morning that grant us the opportunity to lead the country as a Senate of Kenya in making the right and the correct decision so that we don't lose our country. I say this at this particular time, Mr. Speaker, so that people may know that in whatever we say, in whatever we do, anarchy is not an option. I'd wish to plead even to those that are leading these protests and uh, demonstrations that if Kenya was to sink, unfortunately, not even them will be spared, Mr. Speaker. And I like the fact that many of the people have begun speaking out and saying that there are certain conditions that you must meet even as a person in some of the solutions that you are prescribing. Because you listen to what is being said in the online spaces, Mr. Speaker, some of the solutions that you can clearly see, this, is, this will get us into more problems than already we are, are being unfortunately prescribed on us by people who are not within the borders of Kenya. And that's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker. But like I have said, it's not time to apportion blame and point fingers. It is time to lead the country and point them to the right direction. Because what our young people have done is that they have spectacularly, perhaps, painted better than Galileo could ever paint, Mr. Speaker, a picture perfect of the reality of what it means to live in the Republic of Kenya today. Nobody could have done it any better, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, it's our duty. We are duty-bound as an institution to lead. Mr. Speaker, corruption has featured prominently in this conversation. In fact, at the heart of it, perhaps finance bill was just but a trigger. But the bigger conversation that the country is having is on the issue of corruption. And what is it that we need to do? We passed the new constitution in 2010, Mr. Speaker, and we thought at that particular time that we had finally succeeded to slay the dragon of corruption because this is a challenge that as a country we've dealt with the last 60 years or 50, uh, Mr. Speaker. But the question that people are saying is that instead of actually uh, getting better despite the fact that we have uh, created independent offices, Mr. Speaker, it has become worse. ESCC has crafted and that's a conversation that uh, we will need to have as a house. And eventually, Mr. Speaker, something that we haven't resolved at this point is when we have the thematic area, shall we resolve them as a committee of the whole? There's a big thinking that says, given the national importance of this conversation, we cannot even relegate it to the committees. There are those that hold a slightly different view, and we will, we will, we will, we will take time to reflect, and I am willing to be persuaded as I listen to my colleagues when they'll be speaking on this issue, Mr. Speaker, whether we deal with it as a committee of the whole. Because we must invite ESEC here, Mr. Speaker. And they must tell us, Mr. Speaker, why is it that we are not succeeding? Is it the law? What is it, Mr. Speaker? What do we need to do as a country? Because what we know for sure is that the system has set up, even this design in our counties, Mr. Speaker, of saying you have an ethics and anti-corruption officer at, 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 at every county, Mr. Speaker. Basically, what it takes is that they are quickly captured, Mr. Speaker, and they become appendages of the corrupt system in our various counties, Mr. Speaker. The same can be said nationally. And this issue, Mr. Speaker, if we were to be honest, and I wish that the country also indulges us, is that corruption is not only a problem of leaders. It's a national problem. It's a values problem that we have as a people. We cannot just speak, Mr. Speaker, about what leaders are doing without taking time to consider and say, 
How do we demonetize our politics, Mr. Speaker? How do we make politics less influenced and infiltrated by the power of money, Mr. Speaker? Because unless and until a country has that conversation, Mr. Speaker, I am afraid we are not likely to win this uh, conversation. And part of the proposal that must come out of here, Mr. Speaker, is the process of removing money out of our politics, Mr. Speaker. That has destroyed the fabric of our society. And I like the fact that listening to the president the other day, he said, and this is something that, a conversation that many of us have had many times, that even this issue of Harambe is the way it's being uh, done, Mr. Speaker. This presentation of resources, Mr. Speaker. That perhaps it's time to ban it from us as public officials so that when I go before people, I tell them about policies that I have made to make their life better, not the two million shillings that I'm carrying in my car to give them to build a classroom for them. Uh, Mr. Speaker. That's a challenge that we must be willing to accept. Because, Mr. Speaker, until, and I must repeat, until we demonetize our politics, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the space of influence, it will continue to be a gold rush and the desire, uh, Mr. Speaker, on every member. You know, the, people don't know that the cycle of, and the life of a politician in this country, it involves running Monday to Thursday, collecting as much as you can only to go and spend it on Friday to Sunday. And in fact, most of that money, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't even get to the houses of these members. People don't know. If a member makes perhaps a million within a week, they'll be very lucky if 100,000 makes it to do anything in their house. 900 of that money goes back to the constituency. Therefore, we must remove that demand. And this desire to see members of parliament and politicians and people who are in public offices, Mr. Speaker, as if they are tools for pushing resources and money until we, we do that. But that's not, that's, that's, that's just the effect. What we need to address here today is a structural fight and those that are in the justice and, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, law and order society, that they must come here and we must reveal to each other and tell each other, why is it difficult? ESCC must appear before us, Mr. Speaker, and they must tell us this is what we need to do so that we know, Mr. Speaker, why is it we are now in the third cycle of county governments, Mr. Speaker? Everybody knows why people can almost kill each other to be county governors, Mr. Speaker. But we don't have a solid case, not one, not one, before any courts of law that can point out and say this is what we have done as an institution. So that people know this is what we are doing. We will be willing, Mr. Speaker, because this has featured prominent. We are being even challenged, Mr. Speaker, as an institution on the things that we have done and said and the laws that we have passed. We must make it difficult. It must pain people, Mr. Speaker, to break the system after we repair it. it must, the, the, the punishment must be punitive, Mr. Speaker, so that it gets to a point where people fear. You know, people don't fear to be corrupt in this country. Because they know what is the worst that will happen. I will be taken to court. I will pay a bail. And I will walk scot free. Chances are I'll enjoy that money until I die. ESCC must come to us, Mr. Speaker, and tell us even this new jurisprudence that they are trying to establish where somebody steals a billion then says, I am willing to part with 300 million and we, we, we remove the case. Unless we didn't read properly. But, good leaders I have said, this is not the time to apportion blame. If there are things that they want us to change, is it their budget? Is it the law as we defined it, Mr. Speaker? Let us listen with an open mind and say, tell us what it is that will respond to this uh, particular issue. Mr. Speaker, the judiciary also has been very silent while all this has been going. In fact, the only thing I've seen the Chief Justice speak about was on the issue of uh, abductions and I think later on when her chambers were raided she issued a statement or something uh, to that effect but listening into what we are being told and the conversation going around part of the broken system is our judicial system Mr. Speaker people know Mr. Speaker that even if you are taken to court you can find your way around it Mr. Speaker that you can buy uh, justice a country that sells its justice Mr. Speaker is not a country If I know that all it takes for me 
to get away with murder, Mr. Speaker, is sufficient resources in my bank account, then that is not a country. Judicial Service Commission, Mr. Speaker, just like us and all of us that are in positions of responsibility, Mr. Speaker, must engage and be willing to guide us and say this is what has happened. If you listen as people who are speaking, people have shared their experiences, how they have been disinherited of properties that you are left by their parents because a rich person showed up, Mr. Speaker, and as orphaned children, they could not put up a fight before our courts of law. That is not the foundation of a judicial system, Mr. Speaker. And we need time to reflect. JSC must tell us what is it that we need to do, uh, Mr. Speaker. Equal opportunities has featured prominently. Many people are saying, we know that all it will take for you to get unemployment anywhere is to our people of influence. We have constitutionally mandated institutions, Mr. Speaker, NCIC, and so many others. Let's see the studies that they have done so far out of the millions that we have sent to them over the years. Are they just collecting per diems and traveling to Naivasha? Or they have done a scientific study that can help us to appreciate? You know, the problem in this country, Mr. Speaker, is that people love proposing half solutions. And that's what we are being told, that that is not enough. It is not just enough to tell us that this community has this percentage of jobs, this one has the other. Can you make recommendations? And we are willing to come and pass a resolution of the House, Mr. Speaker. If it is established, Mr. Speaker, that the community that I come from has more than an equal share of opportunities, Mr. Speaker, in the various cadres and levels of government, Mr. Speaker. Let's pass a resolution here and say that until such a time that others get an opportunity, equitably, uh, Mr. Speaker, we don't give chance to those because, but unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, listening and reading the reports that have come from NCIC, it is so basic and, and uh, it's like the person who designed it just wanted to appease people with little facts here and there, Mr. Speaker. Oh, Kikuyus have this percentage, Luos have the other. That's not enough. Break it down. Work like a serious institution. Tell us how many CEOs exist in public service. Give us their distribution. How many uh, senior level managers exist? How many are ordinary clerks, Mr. Speaker? We could be talking about a particular community that has a certain share, Mr. Speaker, but they are all clerks and drivers. It's not the same. We need a more detailed study so that you lead us as a house into making this conversation. I'm trying to rush, Mr. Speaker, because I know time is not on our side. Governance on our value systems, Mr. Speaker, featured prominently in this conversation. And we must put it either by law, by design. What is it that you do as a public official when certain things are said about you? How is it, Mr. Speaker, that in certain countries... That you as a public official, even when you are just accused of having an extramarital affair, forget about stealing public resources. The system is so advanced that you are challenged and are told, Mr. XYZ, if you cannot be faithful even to your partner, you cannot be faithful to, your current, uh, to, to, to the country, that your character has been found wanting. And people are asked to step aside on such occasions and people do the honorable thing and say, I think I no longer enjoy the trust of the people. Allow me to pursue other things. On personal matters, I'm not talking about uh, public issues, Mr. Speaker. The problem with us is even when we have been challenged on public issues, Mr. Speaker, we still want to stick and die until, you know, the famous quote that somebody once said, I'd rather die than resign. On debt, Mr. Speaker, I have a certain level of risk, uh, reprieve as a person, but it still doesn't help me. Like I said, these young people don't care, and the people that are speaking don't care, because on the two occasions that the debt question appeared before this house the last time, I voted against it, both to move it at $6 trillion and eventually when we moved it to $10 trillion, uh, Mr. Speaker. But that doesn't help. That's history. We can point fingers and say, you moved, you did this or the other. It doesn't matter at this point. The thing we are being told first, Mr. Speaker, is that when Kenyans look keenly, they are trying to locate 10 trillion in the country, and they cannot see it. So they're asking, are you sure, first of all, that we owe 10 trillion? 
and have made public confessions, Mr. Speaker. Those that served with us in the Budget and Finance Committee last time, Mr. Speaker, know that when we asked for Kenya's debt register, it was brought to us on an Excel sheet. No records beyond that. And you're being told, company, this, you owe them this much, this is the rate at which you borrowed, and so on and so forth. It pointed out to a problem. In fact, on the day that I made my contribution and said that I re reject this approval of the debt, uh, raising of the debt ceiling to 10 trillion, that's part of the reasons that I raised that afternoon, Mr. Speaker. And I said, until Parliament has a counter copy of what the Treasury is borrowing, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we rearrange that whole space of our debt, Mr. Speaker, we are not yet out of the woods. Therefore, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the issue of debt, Mr. Speaker. But we are being told that a public audit of our debt situation, Mr. Speaker, is mandatory at this particular point. And I know the executive will do this, but even us as parliament, because it's us who failed in that regard, we must carry out our own. So that we counter check with what the executive is doing. Parliamentary Budget Office can lead this exercise, but if they need the expertise of other audit firms, including international reputable established institutions that can help us in this conversation, people who know about multilateral lending, Mr. Speaker, and going to the financial markets because there are issues of Eurobond there in and other institutions that we are borrowed from, Mr. Speaker, let us have that conversation so that we know, first of all, Mr. Speaker, what is our debt exposure? Look at even the debt ceiling uh, change of law that we did earlier. Makes sense. We argued and said we want to change how we calculate our debt uh, as status, Mr. Speaker, as opposed to having it as a static number, make it as a percentage of the GDP because that's a more globally accepted standard. And that's fine. And I supported that motion, Mr. Speaker. And we said in three years' time, we want to bring our debt sustainability to 55% of the GDP. It is now at 61. We have three years. But what is the plan, Mr. Speaker? What did we learn from the past? How comes when you are passing that particular legislation, we didn't tie it so neatly so that we know? You know, bringing debt as a percentage to the GDP to 55% is not an occurrence, Mr. Speaker. It's not an event. It's a process. You have to grow down your fiscal deficit over the years. We didn't put it in law, Mr. Speaker. And it's not just enough for us to be satisfied and say that we have a promise that in three years' time, that's where we'll be. At the time of exiting this conversation, Mr. Speaker, we must tighten that law so that even as those that do our budget at the Treasury know that the maximum fiscal deficit that we can get for this year, 2024-2025, is this one. And you tighten it so that by 20, you leave them with no option. So that by 2027, Mr. Speaker, when you're supposed to be at 55%, they have no option but to get there. But if we leave the law as it is, I can tell you for a fact that we will get to 2027, we will still be at 60, uh, Mr. Speaker, or even more if we don't change. And we must make a decision, Mr. Speaker, as we re sit and reflect, because... Debt has featured prominently in this conversation. As I move to conclude, Mr. Speaker, SRC, Salaries and Remuneration Commission, have been silent as this whole debate has been raging. Silence is not an option anymore, Mr. Speaker. They have to speak to the country. They have to tell us what is it that you're going to do so that we reduce our public expenditure on wages and salaries from 46% to the mandatory 35%, Mr. Speaker. If it means taking a pay cut, we as members of parliament, Mr. Speaker, good people, we have been told that it's not possible that members of parliament will never do it. We don't have an option. We have must do it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. The yearly increment that is now being discussed that you are being told that uh, I saw that being reported or misreported in sections of the media that we are now going to earn more. SRC continues to be silent about it, but we must make a resolution and say we reject even that one in light of the financial situation. But as it is, Mr. Speaker, as it is, as it is, Mr. Speaker, even if the high earners 
were to take a shave on their salary. That is still not enough. I don't have the statistics, and that's why I've said some of these constitutional commissions have failed us, uh, Mr. Speaker. I don't know what would be the percentage of Kenyans say that and over and above 100 and 150. But I'm certain, Mr. Speaker, they are in the slim minority of less than 10%. 90% of our public uh, officers learn, earn less than 100,000 and below, uh, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, whatever savings that we can make there, let us make. But over and above, the thing that people don't like, Mr. Speaker, and we, this featured prominently, Senator um, Omogeni is out, but he knows this featured prominently in our NADCO talks. And a report that we tabled here, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, which we haven't done with speed, Mr. Speaker, captured all the wastages that are in the public expenditure space and what we need to do as a country. From page 546 of the NADCO report, I think, to almost uh, page 600, Mr. Speaker. Where things that we can, we understand, we, things are tight. It's the most obvious thing that people do. Young people are telling us when you have a job with uh, Safaricom, you can live in Langata. But the day you lose that job, you move downwards to either to South B or Moja until things get better. That's what we are not able to do as a leadership. We know for a fact that when things were better, we could all fly business as members of parliament. But if you read the recommendations from NADCO, we have said any flight that is less than three to four hours, surely, surely, must you fly business as a public official? Three hours. You will not even sleep. You know? And so many things, Mr. Speaker, recurrent expenditure and wastages. Institutions, even parliament. And you know, I saw our staff criticize us and say, yes, we have been saying this or the other. But even our staffers, they need to know that this must come to them. You know, I've served as staff welfare chair, so I know a thing or two about expenditure in this institution. You will hardly get anybody in parliament, Mr. Speaker, on a Friday. Even to consider a report on something that happened in parliament, Mr. Speaker, people cannot consider it in parliament. It must be considered in Naivasha or Mombasa. As is the case in all our public institutions, we must lead by example, uh, Mr. Speaker. And before we exit, out of this motion today, we must give a blow by blow detail and say, what is it? What happens? Why is it that people cannot think in public offices on Fridays? That there must be somewhere in Naivasha, there must be somewhere in Kisumu, there must be elsewhere. Mr. Speaker, I don't think that there is any correlation between better consideration of a, of a, of a tender document or evaluation exercise that comes when you leave Nairobi, Mr. Speaker. These are extraordinary times, Mr. Speaker. And I must appreciate that there has been guidance, Mr. Speaker. And we are being reminded that because the finance bill has now been sent back via presidential memorandum and all clauses have been deleted. You know, that's a space that many people misunderstand. And sometimes we need to help people also appreciate parliamentary procedures. Number one, finance bill remains to be a bill. It's not an act of parliament, like many people have seen misreported in public spaces and says, oh, it takes effect on such and such a day. But as a sign of goodwill and trust, because trust has been completely eroded at this time, Mr. Speaker, I think the worst thing to do is for the National Assembly to come. Uh, the Budget and Finance Committee considers that recommendation immediately, Mr. Speaker, so that people are satisfied that that is behind us. But having done that, of more importance, the National Treasury must table the new budget estimates that captures, Mr. Speaker, the new reality. Less 3.9 trillion, less the 346 that was lost. And people must take a cut. In fact, my proposal, Mr. Speaker, it's a very simple exercise. 346 out of 3.9 uh, trillion budget, Mr. Speaker, is 9%. At least at the national level. Because I wouldn't wish that the same be applied to our counties. For counties, it must be on equity basis, Mr. Speaker. But on government, national government institutions, just to a pro rata, cut. If your budget was 300 billion, Mr. Speaker, as a state department or an agency, you just do, you submit your new estimates less than 9% so that you are left to go and do the reappropriation of whatever needs to be done. And by next week, Mr. Speaker, we have a new uh, budget that captures that particular reality because 
like we are being reminded living within our means is not an option anymore and i believe that when our colleagues reconvene in the national assembly they'll be guiding us in that particular but i have to be specific and say because in the first instance the distribution to counties was not pro rata then the shave i don't know what is being proposed and we will we will wish to be reason but it cannot be pro rata to counties mr speaker we must at the very least i know it's not in my place but at the very least mr speaker counties should not get less than what they got last year at the very least mr speaker i know it's difficult but somehow somewhere we must protect though members i don't know if you follow this conversation even in our own county level people have become more critical in budget making process and they are beginning to ask our county governors can you lay out your budget in public so that we see also where is your confidential vote like there was you know there are many budget lines that people don't follow but now people are becoming more alive to reality of the budget making process in our counties and we'll speak later i'm sure when colleagues speak they will get time i cannot uh, say everything to say on also the architecture of devolution whether as as is presently moving mr speaker whether it can work you know mr speaker you you are governor between 2013 and 2017 many young people women and the vulnerable made a life out of doing business with counties and there was spread of resources within you know in every village you could see a young person and you'd be told so and so he's a road contractor he supplies this and the other he trades with the county and therefore people could begin to appreciate these are things that were completely unknown to the country before the promulgation of the new constitution post 2017 there are no such people in our villages mr speaker in fact i have said on the floor of this house many times that unless the governor is your personal friend or sometimes even unless he's your father nobody can dare supply to our counties anymore nobody can dare trade with them as protectors and custodians of devolution mr speaker the house charge you the responsibility to make sure that devolution works in our county before we exit this motion we must propose a way forward if it means forcing our governors to first clear all the pending bills that have been found to be uh, uh, eligible mr speaker before rolling out any new development so that you give life at least to the many women and young people mr speaker that have lost whatever little savings they, that they had by trading with counties mr speaker we must pass that particular resolution uh, today mr speaker on the issue of police i just want to speak to two final issues then i conclude i once said in a public forum i was asking where is the IG? That was in relation to the killings that were going on in uh, Kerio Valley. It's been two weeks of protests, Mr. Speaker. Kenyans have lost their lives. Others have been beaten. There have been challenges. Police have faced also very difficult and uh, hostile uh, gangs on the streets. I am yet to hear the voice of the Inspector General. I am deeply troubled by that, Mr. Speaker. It cannot be right. We were in this country, though I was not a leader and I was a young person in university, Mr. Speaker, when we faced the post-election violence, day by day, General Hussein Mohammed will brief the country and speak to the country and give them an update of what is happening. How can we face such a crisis, Mr. Speaker? Up to this particular point, I don't know what the Inspector General thinks. I don't know what is the challenge. We don't know these things that are being discussed. Mr. Speaker, the question at the back of my mind, is this really the right man for this job? Mr. Speaker, we must think critically, finally, about Article 37. We have had conversations and debates here on this House were the demonstrations peaceful or not? How is it that we continue to struggle as a country with this thing of peaceful demonstrations? What is it that we are supposed to do? Can't we guide and provide the way forward so that people can know that if I want to peacefully demonstrate as expected of me under rights guaranteed under my constitution, what is it that we are supposed to do? 
Because a new trend is emerging. And we have seen this, Mr. Speaker, where any time when you organize a demonstration, infiltration and separating between those that are peacefully protesting, Mr. Speaker, and those that want to take advantage of the environment and the climate that has been created is difficult to distinguish. And I'd wish to request the House that we don't exit on this motion until first we provide the way forward and guidance. I listened, for example, Mr. Speaker, to one gentleman, one of the organizers of the Occupy Parliament uh, crusade, and he said, according to them, they just wanted to come and sit outside here and listen and make noise as the debate on the finance bill was ongoing. And I said, okay, fair enough. But unfortunately, in the way that they communicated, it was impossible to tell how to do that kind of an occupation. I wish, Mr. Speaker, at that point, that there had been an engagement, either with your office, because you are the person who permits uh, this kind of engagements, so that we know how is it that if today there are 100,000 people who want to come and present a public petition to Parliament, we should be able to facilitate it. So that they know what time they'll come, how, what they want to do, so that we set the rules and agree, and people know and we don't provide an environment or a climate that is right for people with sinister motives, Mr. Speaker. I know for a fact that it was not the design of the young people that wanted to protest outside Parliament for Parliament to look like it looks this afternoon. They had no intention of burning anything. I don't think it was in their design to destroy the amount of property that has been destroyed here. I don't think it was in their design, uh, Mr. Speaker, for members to flee for their life. They wanted to come and present a petition. Therefore, we have to think and propose as a way forward of how is it that we can guarantee every citizen how we protect their rights because there are two inherent dangers, Mr. Speaker. If we don't provide a way forward and a way out of this particular conversation, then it shall be known forever, Mr. Speaker, that it is impossible to have a peaceful protest in this country. Yet other countries have it. When we travel, even... Anyway, I don't want to get into a diplomatic challenge by mentioning uh, various countries, Mr. Speaker. But there are countries that you think even are less democratic, but they have provided the space and the means for people to exercise their democratic right on the right to peaceful protest, Mr. Speaker. And it's provided for, and people make their voice heard. I don't know how we can do it. I know colleague members can guide us on how this is done. But the long and short of this conversation, Mr. Speaker, is that we are sick and the ordinary medicine that we have administered over the years is not likely to heal us. We need new medication, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, with those many remarks, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move and request the leader of minority, Senator Justice Retired Stewart Mazayo, to second this motion, Mr. Speaker, and lead the country towards the right path. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.